Okay, let's, uh, let's get started. Good afternoon. My name is Gaiman Yim, the uh, Technical Director of the I4 Energy Center, and welcome to uh, today's uh, seminar. Uh, I want to say welcome to those that are viewing uh, via the web. And uh, today's seminar is the last of the semester, so um, uh, don't come next week. We won't be here. <laughs> Um, but we'll get started again uh, uh, in the fall. So look for the schedule. Um, you know, and you st you'll probably get your standard uh, email notice uh, once we get started again. Um, today's speaker is Joel Cubby. Uh, he is an associate professor of electric engineering in the Baskin School of uh, Engineering at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, his research is in the area of uh, microelectromechanical systems. Uh, with applications in optics, uh, fluidics, and uh, uh, biomems. Uh, prior to joining UC Santa Cruz in 2005, he was an area manager with Xerox uh, Wilson Center for Research and Technology and a member of the technical staff in the Webster Research Center in Rochester, New York. Uh, prior to Xerox, he was at the Bell Telephone Laboratories in Murray Hill, New Jersey. Uh, Professor Cubby holds a BA in physics from UC Berkeley and a PhD in applied physics from Cornell. Let's welcome uh, Professor Cubby. Mm. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. Um, can you hear me okay? Coming across? Okay. Um, so today I'll be talking about um, a project that we have going on at uh, NASA Ames Research Center that we call the Renewable Energy Microgrid Test Bed. So um, the background for the work is um, uh, we wanted to uh, take a look at uh, what a renewable energy microgrid is, and it came out of, um, the questions came out of a summer school that we've been holding since 2008. It's called Locale RE um, uh, Summer School. The uh, locale stands for Lowland, California. Um, it alternates between Denmark and uh, California, and our first year was in uh, uh, part of the Denmark called Lowland. And so I'll, I'll talk about a project that came out of that uh, summer school, which originated the uh, uh, microgrid test bed. And then uh, how we set up that test bed at NASA Ames Research Center. Um, I'll talk about how we configured the system, optimization, and how we're moving towards energy storage in the system. And then um, uh, for the final part of the talk, if I have time, I'll talk about a uh, NSF um, project that we had for putting some of the renewable energy infrastructure online for a student uh, uh, learning experience. So this is a, a slide from uh, Denmark um, talking about uh, how uh, renewable energy is typically distributed. So rather than having just a, a large central power plant um, as uh, um, typical, um, really what you have is uh, renewable um, in different uh, sites. Um, either uh, in Denmark, a lot of the wind turbines are out in the ocean. Um, there may be wave energy. Um, you may have uh, some renewables at the household level. They have electric cars uh, driving around. And so basically it's uh, um, distributed, not all in one place. And so um, the microgrids arise, the need for microgrids arise. So um, what am I talking about with a renewable energy microgrid and why should NASA care about that kind of stuff? Um, typically a uh, microgrid, um, there's different sizes. Um, uh, we're mostly working with kilowatts, so you might call it a nanogrid, but that's just sort of a, a size thing. But NASA typically operates uh, off-grid um, in some locations. Uh, this is the uh, Mars rover, and so basically it has to operate off of the solar cells, um, and it can't connect to the grid. Um, and so the further away you get from the grid, the more sense it makes to uh, be islanded um, where you're not connected to the grid. Another example is the International Space Station, um, uh, where they are uh, using solar panels to uh, power the uh, space station. And uh, Tranquility Base that they had on the moon uh, basically was running, uh, things they left behind were running off of uh, foldable tanks. So NASA um, has continued that, um, and at uh, the Ames Research Center, they have something called Sustainability Base, which is a new building they built. Um, where most of the power comes from renewables. They also have a, a bloom box um, for uh, uh, fuel cell. And this building has been built. This is a concept picture, but they have it now. And this is still a concept, but they want to make a, a sustainable community there. Um, so this is, if you've driven by NASA Ames, this is kind of a landmark. It's a, a big hangar where they uh, um, used to have blimps. Um, I think they may still have a blimp, but... Uh, um, not sure about that. But anyway, um, so you can see that from 101. And then uh, this is a sustainable community that they wanted to have there with uh, research and development. 
So um, the background for our test bed is uh, back in 2008, um, the first year of our summer school, um, we were in um, uh, Denmark, um, and we have projects in the summer school where uh, basically the summer school lasts for about three weeks, and the students uh, work on a project uh, uh, during that three weeks. And one of the projects was uh, something called Electricity Grid Using Localized Renewable Generation. Um, and really what they wanted to do was uh, wind and solar power generation at the household scale and see if that uh, could be balanced by electric vehicles. Since renewables are intermittent, um, if you want to have power all the time, somehow you have to store uh, energy when uh, the renewables are not generating. So that project uh, had a lot of uh, 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 people contributing to it. Um, the students came from uh, different UC campuses. I'm from UC Santa Cruz. Uh, we had uh, some students from UC Merced, uh, Davis. Um, and then we collaborate with some uh, Danish universities. Um, one of them is the uh, uh, Denmark uh, Technological University, um, Roskilde. Um, and uh, uh, we also worked with some government organizations. Baltic Sea Solutions was one of the sponsors for the uh, early uh, summer schools. Um, and uh, the Lowland uh, community, um, which was one of the islands of uh, Denmark where we, uh, we went to. They have a lot of uh, projects going on in renewable energy. So the students in the class, they wanted to ask these questions. Was um, it possible to have a hybrid renewable energy system um, as a microgrid, but using an electric vehicle as battery storage? Kind of the idea was there'd be more and more electric vehicles that are parked most of the time, and so could you use them as a battery um, when they're parked? Um, and could that type of a microgrid system be price competitive with typical grid-connected systems? And then they wanted to compare it, um, what it would look like if it was in Denmark or if it was in California. Um, you got Danish students and California students, so they wanted to compare those two uh, uh, locations. So uh, for California, um, really had an uh, um, abundant sun. You know, if you get down to this uh, corner of the U.S., you got quite a bit of sun, but kind of limited wind. Uh, most of the wind is located along the coast, um, some in the uh, uh, passes, but uh, if you look at the wind map, um, it's mostly here. Um, and so that was kind of the solution for California, was mostly photovoltaic. And in Denmark, um, you don't have as much sun. You still have pretty good sun. Um, this is lowland down here. Um, but you have a lot of wind, um, and basically Denmark's an island, so you're really never very far from the coastline, um, so you um, have quite a bit of wind generation, and that's where most of the renewable in uh, Denmark comes from right now. So two different, two different uh, uh, locations have two different uh, um, uh, renewable uh, resources. So then the students uh, took a look at you know, various batteries, so what kind of batteries are going to become available as electric vehicles uh, uh, become more common? Um, and uh, uh, you can get different sized batteries anywhere. Uh, um, if you remember the uh, GM uh, EV1, it had about a 16.5 kilowatt hour battery. Um, and then all the way up to a, a Tesla Roadster, you can get it with different size batteries, but a, a 53 uh, kilowatt hour battery. Um, and all sorts of things in between. Um, this is the Prius that has a, a nickel metal hydride battery. And then this is a, a Prius with an upgrade um, to a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle with a bigger battery in the trunk. Um, and the cost uh, really scales with those batteries. So you can go anywhere from uh, you know, a, thousand, a few thousand dollars up to $40,000. And so that's a, you know, a sizable component of the price of the, the Tesla Roadster is the, the battery. And so you don't want to kill the battery. Um, you know, that's, people don't want to uh, lose their capacity. Uh, they could be old, but I got some other numbers coming up. Wh which number were you wondering about? Which one? Left hand. Oh, yeah, that looks like it probably should be 2,700 or something like that. Yeah, that might be a typo. Then um, uh, students also looked at different uh, photovoltaics um, uh, that you could get. Um, and uh, you can go uh, uh, anywhere from uh, monocrystal, polycrystal, and silicon uh, uh, solar cell up to a triple junction with different costs. Uh-oh. I don't think we want that. Oh, it's gone. Um, and uh, so it, uh, this is an example of a triple junction with a uh, concentrator that Roland Winston at UC Merced works on. Um, basically, it's a very expensive photovoltaic, but it has very high efficiency. 
Um, but uh, uh, since it's so expensive in terms of the material cost, uh, you collect the uh, light um, with these uh, collectors. But anyway, uh, the, uh, um, uh, for the project, they ended up with the uh, polycrystalline silicon um, uh, solar cells for their modeling. Then they modeled the uh, sys various systems with something called Homer, um, which uh, um, is uh, freely available from uh, NREL, and it's also being commercialized um, uh, uh, by a, a startup company. But basically, the idea is um, um, you can put in different power sources like photovoltaics and wind turbines and things like that, um, and you can have different forms of storage, like a battery bank, um, or you can have flow batteries and uh, different loads. Um, so um, you can add these on. So this is, you, you configure a system something like this. Um, you can have a converter um, between AC and DC. Um, and one of the things that we're um, interested in is adding in electric vehicles to the Homer model. Um, so an electric vehicle, in one sense, uh, might look like a battery, but the battery can drive away. Um, so it's uh, uh, only there part of the time. So you could uh, add an electric vehicle or something like that. So for the, uh, for the project that the students worked on, um, they selected um, uh, these components, um, a uh, 7.5 kilowatt um, Berge XL wind turbine, um, and a Toyota, a Toyota Prius with the OMTEC uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle um, upgrade, so um, more batteries in the back, like nine kilowatt hour system. Then they took a look at uh, two different photovoltaics, uh, four kilowatt and eight kilowatt systems and uh, they used an outback 3.6 kilowatt inverter um, for the uh, conversion um, AC-DC. So they, they ran the model, um, and some of their initial findings were that um, the uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle Prius battery was too small to balance the system they had set up. Um, Homer wasn't able to find a system utilizing only the Prius battery. Um, nine kilowatt hours of storage was not enough to balance the system in either Denmark or California. Um, and they found more, um, what you really need is a 50 kilowatt hour uh, battery. Um, so that's kind of like a Tesla level uh, uh, battery. <laughs> Tesla would be nice. <laughs> I actually wrote a proposal uh, to DOE that included 20 Teslas. Didn't get funded, but it would have been fun if it did. <laughs> so anyway, it was an interesting enough um, problem. And one thing that we noticed is, you know, it's very easy to model, but not so easy to validate, um, verify the model. And there, so there's a lot of papers written on uh, uh, modeling of uh, uh, renewables. But we thought it would be interesting to set up a test bed where you could actually try these things out. Um, and we did that at uh, NASA Ames. Um, so this is a view from the building we're in. We're in building uh, N239. Um, and the goals were to set up a uh, uh, microgrid test bed for renewable energy generation, monitoring, and storage, um, and to use that facility for testing systems integration, optimization, um, and control of renewable energy components. And we also wanted to put it online, um, so provide web access to the, uh, um, uh, the, uh, both the generation and the monitoring instruments. And that was uh, a, uh, a proposal that we wrote to NSF for, uh, at that time, it was called a CCLI for New uh, Course Curriculum Development. So this is the stuff that we put into the uh, test bed um, for the energy. This, this is in California, so we really focus mostly on photovoltaics. We got a uh, pho uh, tracking photovoltaic system um, with uh, um, six sharp 180-watt uh, panels and that's mounted on a uh, Watson uh, tracker. So basically, you can tip and tilt the uh, photovoltaic array. Um, the, photo, the, uh, the tracker comes with a uh, light sensor that will try to um, uh, track the sun. But we also modified that so you could disable the uh, tracking system. And so students could uh, tip and tilt the, uh, the panels and see how that affected the uh, generation. Then we also have uh, 18 uh, BP 250-watt um, uh, panels, so those are fixed, um, uh, fixed angle. And then uh, also a small wind turbine. It's an AIRX-12, uh, but it's only like 400 watts. And it just didn't really make a lot of sense to invest a lot of money in a wind turbine at that location. Uh, for energy storage, we started off with uh, uh, sealed lead acid battery, eight of those batteries, so a total of 800 uh, amp hours. And uh, recently, we got an electric vehicle, which has yet to be integrated into the system. Um, that's what we're working on now. 
Um, and the, re the way we chose that one was the uh, size of the battery. It was a 25 kilowatt hour um, battery, um, and it wasn't as expensive as a Tesla Roadster. For energy conversion, we got a uh, Xantrax inverter, and then we have a lot of monitoring instruments. Um, we have an IV curve tracer, um, basically for taking a look at the uh, um, uh, current voltage um, from the tracker um, so the students can calculate the power that's being generated. Uh, we have a weather station um, and a, uh, a wind anemometer. Then we have a, uh, two different solar radiometers, one of them um, that looks at a, uh, a small solid angle, so it's very directional, and one that looks uh, uh, in a wide um, area. So a normal incidence pyroheliometer and a precision spectral uh, pyranometer. We have a data logger, um, and then on the uh, tracker, we put on a, a MEMS uh, uh, inertial measurement unit so that students could see how they had oriented the uh, tracker. Um, when I show it to you, um, you can see a, a picture of the tracker online. We've got a camera, but um, to you know, do some quantitative measurements, it made sense to let the students measure the angles. Any questions on all that stuff? So I've got some pictures of the stuff if you're not familiar with it. So this is, this is basically the system, a wind turbine, um, some photovoltaics, and uh, electric vehicle. So the, the uh, location um, where we're at, uh, this just kind of zooms in. Uh, Dan O'Leary made this video. If you're queasy from lunch, you might want to close your eyes till it gets to its final destination. <laughs> so we're right in here. Um, we have a, a control panel or a control room uh, inside this building. This is the tracker, um, and that's the fixed array. Um, there's an uh, interesting uh, use of this facility for the online uh, learning thing where uh, uh, Elliot Campbell at uh, UC Merced has the students calculate when that shadow is going to hit the uh, tracker. So I thought that was kind of an interesting one. Yeah? What percentage increase do you get using a tracker compared to an ideally situated um, So it varies with the season, um, of course. Uh, but I think, I think you get, you know, on the order like two times as much generation when you... Um, and so... Uh, Pardon? Not that much? What do you think? 30% Really? That's it? This is double. Yeah. So it tracks it as it goes across the sky during the day, and it, it can tilt for the different seasons. But uh, yeah, maybe it doesn't, it's not as effective. But anyway, an interesting thing that Elliot did was. Uh, um, uh, he shows this from Google Earth, and then uh, you know he points out these trees, and you know has the uh, students calculate um, the shadows hitting the tracker at um, uh, different seasons, and so that's uh, kind of an interesting application for the uh, learning. So that's the uh, that's the tracker, and that's the uh, fixed array. Um, so if you if you look up uh, close to the tracker, um, uh, uh, these are the six uh, photovoltaic panels. Um, and then the uh, two uh, radiometers, this is the normal uh, incidence pyroheliometer and this is a precision spectral pyranometer on either side. And kind of hard to see up here, but that's the sensor that automatically tracks the sun. And so uh, uh, Dan O'Leary uh, made it so you could switch that out so that uh, students could control the tip and tilt of the uh, panels rather than uh, tracking the sun. There's a close-up. So basically, this is looking at um, um, uh, more of the sky. Um, it integrates over that whole solid angle there, whereas this uh, looks you know, just with a very directional view. Then this is our uh, uh, wind turbine and metrology. Um, so as I said, we uh, got a kind of a small wind turbine, mostly because uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, uh, wind energy to be um, harvested. Um, if you take a look, uh, this is in Mountain View, um, uh, basically uh, uh, enough to bother the golfers on the golf course, but aside from that, um, you know, I think they chose, uh, you can land a blimp there, and if you have a really windy location, that could be a difficult thing to do. Oh, well, it would be tough to land that thing in the wind. <laughs> um, so um, uh, this is the initial configuration with the wind turbine uh, and the uh, uh, photovoltaics. And then we started off with a, uh, um, basically a, uh, a 1.8 kilowatt system. This is something I have at my house. Um, basically has some uh, lead acid batteries in here and an inverter there. Um, I live in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and so my power isn't so stable. So this can get me through like a week of uh, 
power out, which is not an unusual occurrence in the winter. So any, any questions on uh, uh, that setup? Pardon? Um, so there's loads inside the uh, uh, control room. Yeah. Um, eventually, we want to have the, the electric vehicle there as a load. Uh, for their for their modeling, yeah, they model different loads. Uh, um, they were looking at typical um, uh, Danish and uh, U.S. homes, basically, um, and they got data online. Homer also comes with some data available, um, but uh, yeah, they were basically modeling those two different you know homes in different countries. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh huh. I'm not aware of that modeling, but uh, you know, there's a lot of modeling going on. Homer doesn't have uh, electric vehicles in it yet, and that's one of the things that we wanted to work on was to add that in. So one of the considerations with, um, oh, I'm out of time already. Oh no. Oh no. I keep oh. going. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the considerations of using um, the battery in an electric vehicle is the impact you're going to have on the uh, vehicle's lifetime, and so um, uh, that's one of the things we wanted to look at was uh, um, could you um, do smart charging and discharging of the uh, the vehicle and kind of give the owner of the battery the choice of how they want that to be used. So, yeah, I do want to make sure that the speaker has enough time to complete his presentation. So just clarifying questions only and more in-depth and detailed questions at, at the, the end. end. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we've extended this uh, a little bit. Um, uh, uh, so a, a group uh, at uh, UC Santa Cruz did a project um, in their senior design uh, where they set up this small um, set um, uh, renewable energy um, infrastructure at the Santa Cruz Wharf. Um, and there they chose to use a vertical wind turbine. Um, and the um, idea there was that uh, birds would be able to see it better. So they got a lot of seagulls there. And so it looks sort of like a, you know, a solid um, when this thing's spinning around. They also have a little photovoltaic, but um, bird poop is kind of an issue there. So you know, birds land on it and you, know, you start losing um, some of your power there. It's, it's kind of a, you know, it's an interesting consideration with photovoltaics. I don't know if you've noticed how dirty they get. I mean, certainly the wharf at Santa Cruz is a real problem area because of the birds, but even at NASA Ames, uh, you know, dirt builds up pretty quickly. So I think a real cottage industry, you know, would be, um, you know, like a window cleaner, a photovoltaic cleaner, you know, go out and do that. Because um, I think a lot of people are losing some of their capacity there. Um, then we're also working with Hartnell uh, College, which is in Salinas. Um, and uh, they have uh, some area at an uh, airport. Um, and there we're putting in an EV charging station with a microgrid and a, uh, I think it's a four kilowatt wind turbine. So um, uh, we wanted to look at uh, microgrid optimization, and we worked with uh, Deva, uh, Deepak Srivastava and his uh, uh, postdoc Maxim Maki and Dan O'Leary at UCSC um, is looking into using artificial neural networks for optimization. And kind of the idea there is if uh, um, you had all these different, like uh, maybe wind generation and uh, solar generation and the ability for airy storage, um, uh, could you do some optimization um, using that? So they're just getting started with that, that project now. Um, kind of the idea is you have some inputs, um, you know, maybe latitude, longitude, um, time of the year, temperature, and some weather data, um, and then uh, uh, get an output uh, uh, amount of power you might expect to generate. And also, if you had the electric vehicle in, how much power you're using. And uh, um, uh, when they started off, they took a look at some uh, data that was out there. Um, where artificial neural networks were used to uh, predict solar power and wind power. So you can train a neural network fairly well. Um, this is a reference where they did that. So that's uh, the direction they're going in uh, with that work. Um, Dan is working on adding in um, the uh, power um, data um, from our uh, tracking array, and this is our fixed array. Um, so you can do an IV measurement and uh, calculate the power that you're generating. Um, and then also the... Uh, uh, um, Photo, uh, uh, sun um, uh, insulation monitors. So this is uh, basically the integrating one. This is the directional um, 
uh, irradiance data. So putting that into the, the uh, uh, neural network also. And then uh, we want to add um, an electric vehicle. Um, and so uh, um, what we're going to do is start off with one-way information flow um, from the uh, car um, and put that uh, uh, to the online um, capability. And one of uh, my students, my group, Zachary Graham, um, recently went to Denmark uh, to work with uh, a group at DTO, uh, Danish Technological University, um, on something called the Edison Project. And I'll talk about that uh, uh, next. But basically, uh, um, that's a project um, that's looking at energy storage and um, electric vehicles from wind generation. So uh, Zachary's going to use the interface that he worked on there to interface our car in um, here. So for the energy storage, um, as I mentioned, uh, Zachary Graham uh, went to uh, uh, Denmark for uh, six months. Um, and he worked with a group, uh, Crescent Trailholz group at uh, DTU. We also had a reverse exchange where uh, Stig Hoberg uh, from uh, DTU came and uh, spent uh, half a year at uh, NASA Ames. So we got a, sort of a two-way exchange going. Um, and uh, um, in terms of batteries, uh, this is a more recent uh, rack up of uh, uh, batteries that are available from uh, different cars. Um, and uh, um, Tesla one is, you know, the, um, one of the larger ones. I guess uh, uh, this is pretty large. But, you know, the cost of the battery is going to scale um, with its size. And uh, um, we didn't end up with any of those cars. I'll show you the one that we... Uh, uh, I think that's an acronym. I think it's, um, uh, let me see, does it come up here? Uh, there, there's, a, there's a reference for you. I think it might be a Chinese company, um, but I forget what the acronym stands for. We didn't end up with, with any of these ones. So the average household, I think this is uh, one of the questions, is what if you have more than one car? Um, so if you take a look at uh, kind of the statistics, um, uh, the big slice of the pie is like two cars per household. Um, so um, that's kind of what you're going to have to work with. Then we took a look at um, different electric vehicles that we could uh, um, uh, uh, consider. This is something, uh, uh, this is one of the early electric vehicles from uh, Myers Motors. Um, NMG stands for no more gas, I guess. Um, and uh, uh, this is some of the uh, uh, properties of that. It has a 15 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery. Uh, it could go 80 miles an hour, uh, a range of about 45 miles. It uh, took five hours for full charging. Um, one person could fit in there. Um, and it had a regenerative braking system. So I like that one, um, mostly because it looked kind of like our slug logo at uh, UC Santa Cruz. Um, so you know, I figured we could put some little antennas there you know, and have our, something uh, sort of our mascot. Um, this is something uh, uh, from Green Vehicles called a Triac. Um, and it's kind of like the uh, uh, um, No More Gas, um, but it has a bigger battery, 23 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery. Um, it goes 80 miles an hour, 100 uh, mile range. Um, you can fit two people in there. Um, you can take it on the freeway. It has a regenerative braking system. So it's kind of, you have to imagine like a golf cart going 80 miles an hour. <laughs> And for those of you who have been to Santa Cruz, you've got to imagine that thing going up and over 17. Um, and uh, Zachary Graham did that. I was behind him in my uh, gas vehicle. Um, but it's, it's pretty thrilling. Um, and this is what we ended up with. I'll show you the one that we, uh, we got. But most of the reason I got this is because of the uh, big battery and the low price. Um, unfortunately, the company's since gone out of business. Um, I think they're, they're making an electric vehicle for the early adopters. Like, there's a, this isn't smooth driving. Um, it's very easy to stall. This is, of course, the dream, um, but we can't afford it. Um, and you can get it with all these different sized lithium ion batteries. Um, yeah, you can go 125 miles per hour. Um, the range depends on the uh, um, uh, battery size that you get. Uh, you can charge that thing in three and a half hours um, uh, using level two services. Um, and you can get uh, two persons in there, um, and you go 0 to 60 in uh, 3.5 seconds. So that's kind of a different uh, electric vehicle compared to what we got. But uh, as you're going through the journey of life, as you go uh, through your midlife crisis, this is probably the way to get through it. This is what we got, though. <laughs> <laughs> we call it the e-slug. Um, and so uh, uh, this is what we're driving around in.
Maybe the Tesla. I did, I did, as I mentioned, I wrote a proposal to DOE that would have gotten us 20 uh, Tesla Roadsters, but uh, I think they saw through it. So Zachary uh, Graham um, went to Denmark um, for six months uh, to work on this Edison project, um, and a Danish student, Stig Hoberg, uh, uh, came the reverse. Um, and we've been working with uh, Creston Treholtz group at uh, the uh, Danish Technological University um, uh, for this exchange program. And uh, he's also taking part in that locale RE, Renewable Energy Summer School. So if any of you are, are interested in that summer school, it will be happening uh, this summer in Denmark. Um, so the US students seem to like uh, going to Denmark more than sticking around California. So you might want to think about that. Ah, yeah. Um, it, it's, it's a very unique experience. Um, you get to see quite a bit of uh, you know, real life hardware. Um, so this is uh, uh, the Edison project, kind of an unfortunate name. Um, you know, I would have called it the Tesla project if you know the history of Edison and Tesla. But anyway, you know, that's just my own spin on it. Uh, that's the name they ended up with, and it has a nice acronym from Electric Vehicles and Distributed Integrated Market Using Sustainable Energy and Open Network. So, anyway. <laughs> but I, I, I could come up with something for Tesla, you know. Um, and it has all these different components. Uh, the one that's a DTU that uh, Zachary, uh, the system designed for EV systems. So um, the idea with Denmark is they have a very high wind penetration um, and they have uh, very big uh, near-term goals for being uh, uh, dependent on that uh, renewable energy. But the problem is uh, the wind is low during peak demand um, and so you have to, uh, uh, one, one way to deal with that is to defer the EV charging um, uh, to minimize CO2 emissions related to the charging. So basically uh, um, can you use that, that, charge up that EV at the right time? And uh, where, where the Edison project is happening is on an island uh, called Bornholm Island, um, which is south of Sweden. Um, it looks like it should belong to Sweden, but I'm not sure what happened back in the Viking days. Um, but anyway, um, also the Legos were invented, I think, in Denmark. Uh, and so uh, they made a little Lego thing of uh, Bornholm Island. Um, it has a lot of wind. Um, so with, with wind generation, um, you know, pretty much uh, um, you can generate uh, more energy than you can use, and so now you have to figure out what you're going to do with it. Um, one thing you can do with it is uh, send it off to Norway where you can pump water um, and, you know, uh, uh, use uh, hydro as storage, um, but uh, Norway can't always take the uh, power that you want to send it, so they were looking at using electric vehicles. Um, so they have a very receptive population, um, and uh, they have a small uh, fleet of uh, electric vehicles that they loan to uh, citizens, and they have charging stations with dynamic tariffs. So basically, you know, could you uh, modify behavior based on dynamic uh, tariffs? This is a little video clip. In 10 on, years uh, from now, we have to reduce our CO2 emission by 20%, and this figure will increase both before and after 2020. One of the big sinners is the world of transport. So there's an urgent need for a quick and efficient solution. One solution is the electric vehicle. The greatest potential in an electric vehicle in relation to CO2 reduction is actually its high energy efficiency compared to petrol driven vehicles and the fact that they can use renewable energy from for example wind turbines. The fossil fuels are about to be exhausted, and concurrently with that, the petrol price will rise. Therefore, there will be a great demand for energy-efficient and CO2-free electric vehicles. But we need to deal with some assumptions and cross some barriers before we get that far. What happens if 10% of all vehicles in Denmark switch to electric vehicles? This corresponds to 200,000 electric vehicles suddenly having to be charged in one go. If that happened, the national grid would have to be reinforced and extra big power plants established to compensate for the missing energy when, for instance, the wind turbines produce no power. But according to Energinet.dk, who transmit energy and balance the power production in Denmark, the electric vehicle might well become a big factor in the reduction of CO2 and even redress the power balance if the charging time can be regulated. Right now the uh, car manufacturers are 
developing and designing new electric, electric vehicles. And we are using this time span to um, make the electricity grid in Denmark prepared for electric vehicles. And we hope that there will be a lot of electric vehicles because they can help us balance the grid since uh, especially production from wind turbines uh, comes and goes with the wind. So if we can use electric vehicles to store that energy and at the same time reduce uh, the use of diesel and petrol, then we have also uh, done a very good deal for the environment. This also means we need to optimize the use of energy coming from the wind turbines. Looking at the power consumption over 24 hours, you'll see that in the evening when everybody is cooking and washing, the power consumption is very high, and at night when all are asleep, it's very low. Therefore, there is an uneven balance between power consumption and power production. The wind turbines are indifferent to the skewed power distribution as they often produce power all the time, including at night when hardly any power is used, which means that power will be exported or the wind turbines have to be turned off. This overproduction will increase even more, particularly after the government adopted an energy strategy proclaiming that renewable energy, primarily wind turbines, will be able to generate 50% of the average power production in 2025. But by offsetting the charging time until the wind is blowing and the power consumption is low, the balance will be hugely improved. Does that mean that you as a responsible vehicle owner will have to know when it's best or cheapest to charge your vehicle? No, we are working hard on drawing up international standards for all future owners of electric vehicles. Klaus Andersen is a member of the IEC groups for electric vehicles and power systems and one of the Danish members who has been charged with working out a common European standard. It's crucial for the smart infrastructure for charging of electrical vehicles that we have the international standards. And that goes from the physical plug to the data communication between the electrical vehicle, the charging spot and the whole power grid system. So the vision could be that, as it is today, the mobile phone, whether you are in Germany, in England or Holland, the roaming system takes care of the automatic payment. Several concepts are being worked out for smart charging of electric vehicles. The driver of an electric vehicle can communicate with the power system via a mobile phone. So all you need to do is to choose if you want power here and now, or if the charging is to start when the power is cheapest, never mind where you are. So already now, as you're contemplating buying an electric vehicle or not, a good many people are working out how to make the charging of the vehicle cheapest anywhere with maximum power from wind turbines and with direct billing. In effect, the goal is that your future electric vehicle is going to end up being 100% CO2 free with energy from renewable sources, no nonsense, and that we achieve a balance between the consumption and production in the power system. To top it all, the electric vehicles may well be playing a significant part with regard to the power produced by the many wind turbines being installed in Denmark and in Europe in general. For with the thousands of electric vehicles that will be connected to the grid, they will become a huge charging unit for electricity. So at night, or when no power is being used, and the wind turbines are grinding away merrily, your electric vehicle will automatically be charged with green renewable energy. That way, the electric vehicle may ultimately end up helping us all to reduce CO2 emission. So that's the uh, uh, a video on the Edison project. Um, and uh, uh, this is one of the uh, vehicles that uh, they have at DTU. Um, it's uh, uh, still on uh, uh, Xbox with uh, conversion from AC propulsion. Um, it has like a 240 kilometer range, zero to 100 kilometers per hour in seven seconds. Um, 35 kilowatt hour battery, so a little bit bigger battery than what we got. Um, not quite as cute as the e-slug. Um, but uh, this is what they're, uh, what they're working with on their uh, vehicle to grid um, type uh, work. And this shows uh, a demonstration website they've uh, set up at DTU um, showing basically uh, power going back and forth uh, uh, between an electric vehicle and the uh, grid. So one of the, uh, one of the issues with um, uh, vehicle to grid, if you're familiar with that, is uh, um, what, you're gonna, what impact you're going to have on battery lifetime. So if you're charging and discharging the battery, 
more than um, uh, you might with just your driving by using it for uh, two-way um, uh, power is uh, you could kill the battery, which is expensive. Um, so another way to uh, uh, look at that is to use variable rate charging. So you always have one-way power flow from the grid to the car, but you just vary the level of the uh, power flow. So if you, want, if you need to decrease the uh, load on the uh, grid, you can de decrease the charging rate. So then I mentioned um, that we have uh, um, uh, NSF CCLI uh, project where we're putting this stuff online. And so if any of you are teaching classes in renewable energy, this is available to you. You can actually access uh, uh, the tracker data online um, and use it in your classes. So this is, uh, uh, this is a tracker. Um, it's a view from the control room. Um, so there's a camera looking out at it. Um, you can get uh, uh, data for uh, what direction it's uh, pointing in and uh, uh, data from the radiometers. Um, you can get an IV curve measurement um, for uh, seeing how much uh, uh, power you're generating. And so this is all um, put online by uh, Dan O'Leary. Um, and he's also uh, uh, disabled um, the uh, automatic pointing so that you can actually move it um, online um, so that you can uh, orient it the way that you want and take a look at how the power changes. I think uh, he has some limit switches so that hackers can't get in there and try to find the resonant frequency of the uh, motor. But aside from that, um, you have the ability to move it around. Um, and so this uh, um, is some data from the uh, IV curb tracer and also the uh, um, power that you're generating. And what you can do is you can uh, move the tracker and see how those, uh, uh, the uh, uh, power generation changes. So that's, uh, um, you know, if you had a, a clear day, um, you know, with no clouds and no shadows and stuff like that, um, uh, you know, you could, you know, get some ideal conditions. But even more interesting than that is real world conditions. And so um, if you take a look at some of the data from the uh, radiometers, um, uh, you can see something like this, um, and uh, um, basically you can see that uh, uh, if, you have, if you're looking at a, a small area of solid angle, that clouds go by um, uh, during the daytime. And you can also take a look uh, on a sunny day. Uh, this is uh, some data from a sunny day. This is data from a cloudy day. Um, so basically the um, directional radiometer is getting uh, not much. Um, so that's, it's a nice way to get some real world data um, for a, a classroom. Um, on uh, renewable energy. We also took uh, some students from uh, uh, the Cosmos um, and took them out to the tracker. So in general, when we're, when we're doing the tracker lab module, the students aren't at NASA Ames. They're at their particular school. Um, we run it at UC Santa Cruz, UC Merced, um, and Hartnell. So usually they're, they're online, but uh, these were some high school students who wanted to uh, come to the NASA facility and see the uh, um, actual equipment. So um, some of the conclusions are we got this renewable energy uh, test bed um, under development at NASA Ames. Um, right now we have solar, wind, um, and uh, uh, weather monitoring. Um, we want to add in uh, energy storage and electric vehicles. We got the electric vehicle, the e-slug, and uh, Dan and uh, Dan O'Leary and uh, Zachary Graham are working on integrating that into the uh, microgrid. Um, there's extensions to it. We got one on the Santa Cruz Wharf um, and uh, uh, putting one in at Hartnell College and adding in the uh, artificial neural network optimization software. And we put that tracker online uh, for a remote uh, renewable energy lab. So some of the uh, people that contributed to this, um, as I mentioned, it started off as a project in the uh, low land, uh, locale RE um, study group, summer school. Um, and um, uh, we had uh, uh, Phil Chu from uh, UC Davis, uh, Stig Hoberg, Nan Quinn, and Jiang from uh, DTU, and Jeremy Ebe from uh, UC Santa Cruz. So these are the students that worked together on that initial report. Um, and then uh, when we started setting it up at uh, NASA Ames, uh, we were helped by uh, Rose Grimes, um, Winona uh, Vecatur, Lisa Witt, and Steve Hing. Um, if you've ever uh, um, done a project that involves construction, um, you know how uh, uh, tough it can be, but now you try to do that at NASA Ames, um, the bureaucracy goes up uh, uh, non-linearly, and then you do that in a project that's funded by both NASA Ames and UC Santa Cruz, it's more non-linear. So it's, uh, these people really helped us uh, get that in. Um, and then we've been uh, working uh, with uh, uh, Creston Trehalt at uh, DTU. <coughs> And we get uh, money where we can get it. Um, the uh, UARC Aligned Research Program is some funding at NASA Ames. 
Um, we had uh, funding from uh, Ben Ritty. Um, as I mentioned, we had uh, the CCLI proposal to put the tracker online from NSF. Um, this is a uh, power systems group that's uh, been formed at UC Santa Cruz, and um, we got funding from Citrus, and I'm here today uh, talking about the Citrus project. I think that's about it. Thank you. So we open the floor for questions. Wow, we got one. Um, thanks for <coughs> thanks for the talk. So in the um, the Edison sort of video clip you just showed, they they mentioned they had a a target of converting ten percent of the uh, entire fleet in Denmark to electric vehicle. And uh, um, based on that assumption, they're working to sort of better prepare the grid for that transformation. Um, do you have like a like a quick number on the potential? Because I think I've come across these numbers before in the states. Because certain states, um, also at the federal level, they have sort of some sort of target for electric vehicle adoptions. And based on that, someone did the calculations on sort of the potential for electric vehicle as storage. I think the number was very small, and it was kind of in a sense, disappointing, if that's the right word. Do you have like any uh, sort of uh, quick numbers? I don't have that? any numbers, but I know that the adoption of electric vehicles is going slower than you know, people anticipated. Um, I think part of that is that uh, um, internal combustion engines are getting more efficient. You know, so people are sort of trading off you know, uh, you know, if they're going to really uh, uh, be saving on gas costs and you know, the inconvenience with uh, having a limited range. Um, so. I think also um, the model for the electric vehicle has yet to be developed. Um, so there's different models. Um, one of the, are you familiar with Better Place? Uh, pro, yeah, so basically, they they might own the battery, and so that would kind of change it up. And you would also have uh, battery swapping stations. So rather than you know these multiple hours to recharge, you go in and five minutes they've swapped your battery. I'd probably sign up, you know, in that scenario. That don't really have it here. Um, but they do have it, um, uh, 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 better places working in uh, Denmark and Israel. So, um, you know, I think the particular model has to develop. I'm still driving an internal combustion engine. <laughs> um, I'm, I do, m most of my work is in emerging markets, and I'm interested if you know of anyone doing microgrid test facilities with a much smaller s focus, like a... You know, smaller supply sources, smaller storage sources, and so like watts instead users. of kilowatts. Exactly. Um, um, and, and who's doing work in that space? Well, I think everybody here probably has an electric toothbrush, right? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, it, it's the same. It's very easy to set up a small s yeah. system like this with one vehicle. Yeah. But if you really want to, to test something, you need to look at a, at a community scale where you've got you know ten houses and yeah. a, a bunch of a variety of story systems that may come and go depending on whether it's you know electric cycle or yeah. or fixed battery and I don't know if they're doing it yet but I the place I would look to is um, Davis UC Davis um, they have a, a new sustainable community that they're working on there um, that has a um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, um, good practices being implemented they also have um, a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle um, uh, group there. And uh, one guy that uh, um, we're working, uh, uh, writing proposals with anyway is uh, Andy Burke, um, who studies battery lifetime. So I think that would be a good scenario for doing what you're talking about at sort of the small community level. And I think last week you had uh, Brian Jenkins here, um, so he might be a good guy to ask about that. He, uh, he's also part of the uh, Low Lend uh, Renewable Energy Summer School. Yeah, uh, a comment, perhaps more than a question. Um, yeah. First of all, I loved your talk. It was It's a great project, and I really enjoyed the video clip as well. Uh, the moment that intrigued me the most was when the Energinet guy was saying, oh, we really hope for a lot of electric vehicles, <laughs> because that's very different from what we hear from u electric utilities here in mm -hmm. California, who are quite concerned about the impacts on the distribution systems. So it occurs to me that likely one important difference uh, is that in the European distribution system layout, they tend to have larger transformers and more extensive secondary distribution uh, systems so mm. that 
there is less of a concern that you're going to have three electric vehicles trying to charge on the same small distribution transformer. Right. Mm -hmm. Blow and, it up, yeah. And <laughs> so that's a really, I think, substantive difference between mm -hmm. the two systems because it was so encouraging to hear about uh, their, their optimism in Denmark. I was wondering if you've looked at transformer capacity. Is, is that an issue in a microgrid your size? Um, well, with one car, we would have control over that. Um, but in neighborhoods, I've read about the, the concern. Um, I think um, in Denmark, um, you know, they, they do export energy. Um, you know, so uh, um, they do have to worry with the goals they want to get to, like they talked about in the uh, video clip. That's pretty aggressive goals. Um, and so you know, an island like Bornholm Island, you know, I think uh, um, it really makes sense. You know, and I think that's what the guy was speaking to, is we're generating so much power from wind we don't know what to do with it. Um, so, you know, here in the United States, I don't think that's really the situation. You know, so I think that's one of the differences. The infrastructure could be different and the, um, uh, you know, the characteristics of the distribution could be different. But also the goals are very different. Sorry, one more question. So, um, uh, apparently, there hasn't been much numbers on the cost, the economic side of the sort of the, this kind of project yet. Um, just wondering, because I, I suppose part of the rationales of having electrical vehicle as a storage is you can kind of substitute part of the uh, other battery storage you would need for microgrid uh, applications. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you have any sort of again ask keep asking for numbers like a uh, dollar numbers for these kind of projects? I don't have the data, but the place to look, or where I tell you to look, is um, if you go to um, uh, the RISO site um, in Denmark. So RISO is kind of like the DOE for uh, uh, the United States. That's the uh, Danish DOE. Um, and there they have, um, uh, part, of the, part of the project is they have an electric vehicle for energy storage, and they also have a flow battery. So I think they're making those sort of comparisons. Certainly with our sealed lead acid batteries, that's not the way to go. Um, but um, you know, that's all we could afford at the time. So that's why we got those. But I think, uh, I think in Denmark, they are looking at those trade-offs. And you know, it's like very large flow cells that you know, could store quite a bit of uh, energy. Well, question. Thank you very much. Yeah.